Hello, I'm Fantani the Scar Ghost. Today I'm going to show you something that is incredibly interesting. Um, it is an interview that I had with Gregory Jones from NVIDIA. Uh, Gregory manages the CloudXR team, so he deals every day with 5G, cloud streaming, um, virtual reality. It's a very interesting topic and I'm very happy that I had this opportunity to chat with him. So let's all hear what he has to say about this topic. So what I would like to, to say to first of all to say is like introduce yourself. So what, uh, what do you do in your daily life at NVIDIA? Yeah, so I'm Greg Jones and I my overarching role is I'm the global manager for business development for XR. And then within that role, I'm the Cloud XR product manager. And I've been with NVIDIA for a little over two and a half years, and I came out of a, uh, a research group at the University of Utah where I managed a 200-person research group that focused on uh, high-performance computing simulation and, most importantly, visualization of, of high-end scientific data. So it was that, that focus on visualization we've been trying to, for 20 years, we've been looking at how people interact with their data, how, how you can start having a human data interaction instead of a human computer interaction. And that just really dovetails with the idea of XR. So that's what brought me to NVIDIA. Um, that's that's very cool, very interesting. I invite you a bit. Um, I know that you're working on the Cloud XR solution. You recently have read the news about uh, that uh, one point zero version has been released. So can you explain me better what is the Cloud XR? So also for people that haven't heard about it yet. You bet, you bet. So Cloud XR, it's an early product, right? We launched it. We launched it as an early access program back in October, and and just released our 1.0 version uh, a few weeks ago. And Cloud XR is our first uh, library to help stream uh, XR from remote servers. And and really, even though X, the Cloud XR is a brand new product. If you think about our work with streaming, the GeForce Now team has been working on streaming games for you know five or six years now, and we've taken a lot of that expertise and embedded it in the Cloud XR SDK. So it's a new product with a, a long legacy of expertise in you know, streaming graphics content across the inter the internet and the networks and such. But does it also include the, the server part, or is also only the, the streaming uh, libraries? So it's uh, there is also like you know like the AWS uh, pre-configured server machines. So is there also like a server configuration already preset in this SDK or not? No, the SDK is just the literally just the SDK, and what it does is uh, what the really exciting piece of it does is it's an open VR interface. So any open VR application that you have will automatically work with, with Cloud XR without any alteration. Wow. And with just a little, with a little bit of alteration, it can also, any open VR application can stream AR. And, and what I mean by little alteration, you just need to be able to expose an alpha channel, basically. And so it's a really nice SDK in the fact that if you have a server and you're running an open VR application, we create a Steam VR driver that the open VR application just sees as a normal Steam VR driver. It, the application thinks it's handing a frame to an HMD. Instead, we take that frame into our, our server driver and then we create, a, we encode that frame and, and transport it. And then on the device, on the client side, we have another instantiation of our derivative of Steam VR that accepts that frame and then basically hands it to the HMD. And, and so it's a really straightforward library and the application providers, the ISVs, don't have to do anything to their applications to use Cloud XR. That's cool. <clears throat> and what the question that many people have, because you know, also in the VR journalists, uh, many people that are skeptical now about 
via streaming like via 5G or whatever. Uh, they say that they haven't tried yet something that satisfied them for frame rate distortions and such. So what are the performances that we can expect now from uh, the Cloud XR SDKs? Yeah, the, the Cloud XR SDK shows, so I, I use it on my home network. I have a, a, a basically a workstation and I, I stream to an Oculus Quest and, or a, a Vive Focus Plus or a, 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 Vive, uh, a Vive Pro and I use a Windows client for the Vive Pro and of course the Android clients for the Oculus and the, and the Focus Plus. And it, it's just like being native uh, XR. So the keys to, to having a good experience, um, of course, are, are frame rates and, and, and latency. And we manage the frame rates within the, the Cloud XR package to match that of the, the, the device, the end device we're streaming to. Um, the latency is the, is the big question, right? So there's a, a combination of things that create that latency. One, the render time, obviously. Um, and then when you're gonna when you're gonna stream, you have to encode and decode, and and get across the network. So you add a bunch of latency. So you know, everything to reduce that latency is important, and to have a, a really fast network, and and also to have a, a relatively robust network. So the way we manage, for instance, jitter on on our Cloud XR is we buffer against the jitter, and so creating a buffer induces latency. So if it's a really noisy network, you're going to increase the latency. And if you have a really slow network, so your ping time is, is a lot of milliseconds, that may be too much latency. So part of it is getting a, a system with low latency, and that requires a pretty fast uh, network, and then a pretty, a pretty noise-free network. And, and then, then the, the real question is how to manage all that latency, because you don't have a lot of milliseconds before you induce the, the VR sickness, uh, the, the kind of vestibular yes. system confusion that creates that motion sickness. But if you're a combination of how you use that latency, how you use late latch or asynchronous time warp, those types of strategies to manage that latency or hide that latency, that's really the key to the, the Cloud XR is managing all those factors, your, your compression, um, your encode, decode, your jitter buffer, all those things together, managing them kind of holistically or globally to give a nice smooth frame rate on the device. And, and we think, you know, using using our streaming technology plus the way we've built Cloud XR, uh, using our Steam VR driver and Steam VR client, we've managed to balance all those those competitive features into a really nice streaming situation. And, and it works better on lower latency networks and 5G. You know, if you think of 5G, uh, people think of just the edge on 5G oftentimes, right? So we'll have yes. a compute at the edge and the compute will be, you know, less than 10 milliseconds away. And that makes for a really low latency network. 5G will have better, better management of the streams to the users, better beam forming and such. And so 5G will be a, a really big deal for this. But, but also 5G will have an overall better network. So not just the edge network will be better, but the overall network will be better and, and lower latency. And, and eventually, you know, right now we, we build a frame at the server and then we transport that frame. But eventually, you know, you will have different compute going on with XR workloads. Like if I'm doing AR, a lot of what I'm going to do is, is contextualize the data that I'm seeing in front of me, and I'm going to have some kind of inference happening somewhere in the network, and contextualizing and putting more information about what I'm seeing into my view. And and those don't necessarily need to be 20 milliseconds. Those could be maybe 100 milliseconds. So that can happen somewhere else in that network. So what's what's really cool about the whole 5G thing is all these networks and how they're orchestrated will give us different compute at different latencies that will fit in differently in the XR, in the XR um, environment we're creating. So the Cloud XR right now is just giving a great XR experience by managing latency, managing bandwidth, 
and, and all those things actively and, and more as a global solution than is trying to eliminate things. Sorry, that was really long. Sorry. No, it was super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, get the question. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the five G hype is justified. I, I think as G <laughs> rolls out, it's gonna be it's gonna be just a huge advantage for X summer. Okay, so since you, you said this, um, there are many people talking about 5G. I, I have always lots of debates about uh, if 5G is actually useful or not. Personally, I think it will be very useful. But I know also very uh, some experts in the UX I feel that I respect that uh, they say that it's just hype. Uh, they don't know if it will really be useful. So how do you envision the 5G being actually useful for XR? Yeah, yeah. So that's it's a great question. So one of the problems, like if I'm in a if, if I'm doing cloud XR across Wi-Fi, for instance, yes, I, I do it in my home. You know, and I make sure there's not too many devices on. I make sure my router's close, and and all that makes an environment where I have a pretty low jitter network. My my latencies are short, and cloud XR streams VR great, right? So that's a great solution. If I'm if I'm in an environment where there are more users, like let's say uh, someone wants to to run a manufacturing floor with a hundred people wearing uh, AR devices, and so now Wi-Fi Wi-Fi five, let's say, um, I'm going to have a lot of a lot of interference in that network. I'm going to have a lot of jitter, and that jitter, the way the way you're going to have to manage that jitter is with buffering. That's going to take latency. And so you're going to induce more latency in the signal because you have a, a network with a lot of interference. So now if you think of Wi-Fi 6 and and you think of um, 5G, both with their new beam forming, their multiplexing type of technologies, you're going to see a better managed signal to each user. And that, that management plus the low latency plus the bandwidth will be what makes 5G really useful for, for XR. So, yeah, I think it's going to make a big difference in, in how those – signals are managed from cell to, to person, the device. Okay, but some people say, yeah, yeah, 5G is cool, but now that we can very soon, Wi-Fi 6, so we don't need 5G for that. We have a very broad Wi-Fi connection. So how do you answer to, to this? Yeah, I think both are going to be important. I think they're both going to be important technologies and really we'll start seeing use cases and and it's going to come down to empirical data and what works best. So I think I think both will be important. Uh, 5G, again, I'll say, you know, part of the magic of 5G is the whole telco network that will be behind the 5G signal will be a really enabling network. But, you know, I can see, I can see really nice use cases where you get 5G to your home, so you have access to that whole network, and then in the home you're running Wi-Fi 6, and that's where you're streaming your XR, is actually from your home device to your your tetherless headset. So I think the combination of Wi-Fi 6 and 5G are going to be extremely important. And and also, you, know, you can think of cable companies already delivering you know high bandwidth to the homes, low latencies, and that hook to Wi-Fi 6 will be important. So so I think you know welcome all the different uh, frequencies for the part of it. And just being able to use the entire network is the promise of 5G. And then in home and, and on prem, you know, really getting the Wi Fi 6 out and, and letting that work in specific locations, that combination will be really astounding. I completely agree with you. I can't wait for 5G to be fully developed. Luckily, also, my city, Turin, was one of the first in Europe to have uh, experiments with 5G. Oh, cool. yeah. so the demo we ran at Mobile World Congress in, in October, we, we had a server in the Verizon data center in LA, and then we streamed uh, a McLaren Senna rendered in Autodesk V-RED to a 5G cell phone and did a nice AR demo. And, uh, and Jensen actually showed this in his keynote at Mobile World Congress. But that demo worked flawlessly, and I think we had a, a network latency of five milliseconds, and that was from a, an L.A. data center down to the floor of a convention center, big noisy convention center, on a cell phone and on a production 5G network. And that demo was, was gorgeous. And so if that's the, an indicator of what's coming with 5G, I'm, I'm really excited about it. 
Um, returning to the CloudXR SDK, so can I ask you in your lab settings, so the optical settings, how much latency do you obtain in the wall, uh, decoding, transmission, etc., encoding, transmission, and decoding process? So what is the minimum that you have, or the mean? Yeah, so if you think about, you know, a lot of it depends on the render time. So let's say we, we have a 20 millisecond render time. And you're going to add anywhere from three to seven milliseconds for encode. Same thing for decode. So then you're up to, let's say, maximum, you're up to 34 milliseconds. If the network adds 10, you're up to, to 44 milliseconds. And then if the network's at all jittery, you're going to add some buffering time. So let's say you're, you're 60 milliseconds of latency. And, and, you know, if I have a latency of 60 milliseconds, and I hand that frame to the to the headset, and the headset asks me for a, a warp of the frame to match its current position, and I warp that frame on the client side GPU, then I've I've hidden that 60 milliseconds of latency, and I have a you know essentially a three millisecond image in front of my eyes. Wow. And so, yeah, and then and then you know so let's say 60. 60 milliseconds is where we sit with a with a relatively heavy render, and that was with 10 milliseconds of, of ping time on your network, and and you know really quiet really quiet network. So I'm not going to add any jitter. So take 10 milliseconds, and every every you know if you have a 20 millisecond network, then you're going to have 70 milliseconds of latency. If you have a, a 30 millisecond network, you're going to have 80 milliseconds of latency. And, and then in, in, in that space, once you start getting high enough, it's really depending on the app. So you can imagine if you're playing a game with a lot of hand motion and my, my you know, I'm using late latch or asynchronous time warp or something warp basically um, to hide my latency for the visual, my hands are gonna start lagging. So, you know, some instances you're gonna, you're gonna say a professional gamer is gonna go, I can feel a lag. But, uh, you know, a gamer like myself, or an industrial use case person won't even notice the, the difference between uh, visual and hand movement. So then, then you get into cases of, you know, should we start rendering the hands on the device so there's no lag in that and that type of stuff. But, you know, for your, the question you were asking, 60 milliseconds, 50, 50, 50, 60 milliseconds seems like the minimum latency we have in, in the whole system right now if you have a, a pretty significant render in your in your application so very, very interesting explanation and um, my question is since i'm a developer and i'm very excited about the rmbr i also work with um you know as a consultant with the uh, enterprise customers so i'm very intrigued by the cloud xr sdk i want to ask you if other people like me want to try this solution. So uh, what they, do they need? What is the price? Uh, how can we try the CloudXR SDK? Yeah, super. So the, the CloudXR SDK is, is free. It's an SDK, like most of our SDKs are free of charge. It's on a, you know, we've got it in a gated release right now. So, um, so what you would do is go to our, our website, our dev zone, Search on Cloud XR, and if you just do a search on NVIDIA Cloud XR, and that should get you to the application page. Put in an application, uh, shoot me an email, and I'll see your application. And, and if you if your email explains what you're doing, then I can consider it in the in the early gated release. But in a in a few months, we'll open it up more. But uh, it's at, it's available now, and no charge. And just know that your server side GPU. Um, where the where the driver sits needs to be a Pascal or later generation graphics card, and right now we we have uh, we have uh, APKs or, or clients. We support a Windows client for for Vive Pro, and we support a Android client for Oculus Quest and for um, Vive Focus Plus. Now the the SDK comes with that that. Focus Plus SDK or client side comes with a uh, an open source. It comes with source code that shows how we built that that APK. So if people have devices they want to build an APK for, there's a template right there, and they can use that that source code to make their own APKs for their own devices. Wow! Welcome any 
any HMD manufacturer that wants to write an APK for this, we, we welcome, you know, working with them. Wow, really? I didn't know that. It's, it's super. So every new headset that is coming to the market for AR, VR can implement this just by modifying your code, basically. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm changing a bit topic. I'm also, uh, you know, as a VR user in the office or at home, actually I've also in VR graphics card, the GTX and RTX. I want to also to ask you about the future plans of NVIDIA for the graphics card. Uh, if you can tease us something, you know, there are some of these rumors about RTX uh, 30 series. Do, can you say us something? Or? I'm, I'm sworn to secrecy on the graphics card. I don't <laughs> even think they tell me what's actually coming. So, really? <laughs> I think you need to know about Cloud XR, but on the graphics card, I'll stay quiet. But anything I say will probably be wrong. So. <laughs> it could be funny if you spread some fake news. <laughs> <laughs> um. I wanted also to ask if it is, in your opinion, possible that uh, I know that they don't tell you the secrets about the PC graphics card. If it is possible that NVIDIA also targets in the future, I don't know, standalone headsets directly. So not with the streaming, but making chipsets or, I don't know, like Qualcomm or such. Or do you think it's something that is outside your scope? You know, it's, it's always an interesting question. We have, we announced a, a few weeks ago, our collaboration with Qualcomm and, and Ericsson to build, you know, basically build Cloud XR into the boundless XR solution that, that Qualcomm's doing. So I think, you know, for right now, the foreseeable future, what I see is, is really partnering with, you know, innovators like Qualcomm on the client side and really optimizing Cloud XR to be able to talk to those those SOCs. I mean, Qualcomm is quite good. Their XR2 is an exciting chip. So, so I think powering the ecosystem through that is probably our focus for for quite some time. Okay, that's that's nice. And um, regarding the streaming, because we talk a lot about streaming, so also in the future, I envision. I don't know. For instance, Viveport can become like Netflix and streams all the game, the XR game via the web. Most probably with the Cloud XR SDK. And even here, there are lots of critics about the fact that until now, the streaming, uh, you know, game streaming. Uh, playing games in streaming has never reached a critical success until now. So do you think that the NVIDIA is investing a lot in it, both in XR and also with traditional gaming? So why do you think that until now this, so this kind of solution has never took off completely? And why do you think that is going to happen also with XR? Well, you know, first off, it, it's really hard. Right, it's a really hard problem because networks are complex. The topology of networks are complex. So how to get you know signals across an entire network where you have so many heterogeneous networks out there is is a difficult problem. And that's why GeForce Now um, has worked at it for for so many years. But I think with the the evolving 5G network, the the evolving networks just in general, the solutions that the the GeForce Now team have come up with with streaming. I think gaming is there. You know, Cloud XR is a, is a first step early product SDK to address the XR market. But we're, you know, the thought of working with Viveport and, and other groups like that to embed Cloud XR in their platforms and make it available for them to stream XR from their platforms is really the direction we're taking. And we think that's an exciting place to play. So I think, you know, as the technology gets better, and GeForce Now is a great experience, um, you're going to see the gaming market open up and there will be success in, in that space because, you know, there's, a, as, as our CEO Jensen says, everyone's a gamer. And, you know, a lot of the gamers that, that I think will, will really enjoy GeForce Now and streaming XR and such just haven't had a taste of gaming yet. And as soon as they do, they'll, they'll you know, they'll switch on. So, yeah, I see nothing but, but growth and success in the market from here on out. And, and GeForce Now, in my mind, has led the way for that. 
and, and certainly their technology is leading the way for what we do with streaming XR, and, and we want to embed that in, in other platforms. Cool. And when do you think that in the end, um, you know, everyone is dreaming about like in a headset that works all with streaming to the cloud. So playing the, the prediction game, when do you think that every one of us will just play with screens without a brain and everything will happen to streaming? So both PCs, VR headset, VR headset, in your opinion, when is it going to happen? Five years, 10 years, 50 years? Yeah, you know, I, I, saw some, I saw an Ericsson publication that said 5G in the U.S would be roughly 50% of the U.S. In, in 2023. So so I think it was going a little faster than that. And then, of course, the, the pandemic is, is now, and that's going to affect the growth rate. But the rollout of 5G um, will take probably, you know, five to ten years, maybe ten-ish years. That'll be, that'll be really instrumental in how fast this all comes about. The... The evolution we see, you know, we see new HMDs from each of the HMD manufacturers probably once every three years. So we're probably, you know, we're probably two or three generations from from the lightweight, fashionable headsets we want to wear. And and we've got some graphics technology we still have to create to get you know, light fields and holograms and such into those headsets. So I, I think 10 years we're going to have a really nice solution that, that is really, really uh, ubiquitous. And in five years, we're going to have some great early solutions that a lot of people will use, especially in the enterprise spaces. People will be using them to to collaborate, see their models before, before prototype. So we'll see enterprise lead out. People will find use cases that are really valuable. And, and that's going to happen inside the next five years. And, and then another five years for that to go to the consumer market in a robust way. And that will just dovetail with the HMD manufacturers, the device manufacturers, and the rollout of the 5G network. So that, that's my prediction. <laughs> I'm pretty conservative, though. I'm a pretty conservative guy. It's better like this. Otherwise, people get hyped, and then they say that VR and 5G are dead. It's, it's better to be conservative, in my opinion. <laughs> and <laughs> I'll probably retire in 10 years, so I want to make sure I say 10 years just so I can see it. <laughs> So come on, <laughs> you can do it. I'm sure about it. Um, so you you talk a lot about your, your heart. That it's your job is working with enterprises about the RMBR solutions and XR uh, and 5G and all this kind of stuff. So uh, how do you, uh, from your experience, how VR, XR, whatever are and um, 5G can help the most companies and enterprises. So from your experience, how are you useful the most to companies? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So one of the places companies see uh, XR really, really helping. Gosh, there's so many good answers to that. Um, let's say that I'm, I'm building a hospital. And, and one of the things that happens now is with, we build an operating room the doctors and nurses go into that operating room and they say, wow, this doesn't work for us. We need all these different changes. And all those different changes take months. They're really expensive because you have to remodel real rooms. So one of the use cases that's really compelling is taking a big warehouse and you build VR environments. The doctors and nurses come in and they, they work in the rooms in VR. They come up with all their changes and before the hospital's ever built you know exactly what you have to build to work for those doctors and nurses. So there's those type of examples. There's also the example of, let's say I'm building a, a, a new Tesla and, and my Chinese engineers want to make some design changes specific to China, but they want to work with the California engineers to make that happen. So you go into XR, you bring up the Tesla model, and the engineers don't have to fly from China to the U.S. or U.S. to China. They can just go into XR, work around that model, make changes. And, and so that collaboration piece is, is a huge benefit. But then probably the most important place is take that same operating room. And if I put a virtual patient in there and I put the doctors and nurses in there and I let them train in that operating room, 
then when it's finally time that operating room's built and it's time to go in, I already know how to work in that operating room. So the training piece of the XR in, in environments where you, you want to already be trained before you step into the environment, maybe it's a dangerous environment and you want to make sure you don't make mistakes, um, that training is probably the most valuable use case there is out there. So the collaboration is not far behind and, and then testing stuff before it's ever built is, is right there also. So I'd say training is, is right now the leading use case and, and really important. Yeah, from my experience also training and maintenance are like <laughs> the most requests I got on companies. In this period also virtual events, <laughs> but I guess it's because of the COVID. Um, talking about something a bit more personal, so what do you love the most about AR and VR? Oh, so so for for most of my adult career, you, you, me and research teams I've worked with have been trying to figure out how not to use a keyboard, right, and how not to use a screen, but to immerse in our data entirely, right, all the way in. So take a take a take an epilepsy case, right? And I want to look at the electrical fields around the head and where those electrical fields are coming from. And I really want to understand the anatomy of the brain and how it generates those electrical fields so I can help that patient uh, with strategies to, to avoid those seizures. Um, being able to jump into the data, go all the way in and not, not, look at, not look at something on a small screen or try to click on my keyboard, to go in and actually tear that data apart with my hands um, is always that interaction with your data, whether it's a car model, a hospital room, a training environment, but the ability to emerge completely in the data, the digital model, is what excites me about VR and, and XR. And, and that's, that's, my, that's been my career, is, is trying to figure out that human data interface and, and how to make it to where you don't see stuff around you, you just work with your data. And, and you see the you know examples in Minority Report and all that, how to get through data quickly. That's that's the dream, and, and that's what I love about it. Uh, we have all seen that movie and that scene that is like magical. I know that the interface probably in real life wouldn't work so well, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so cool to be seen on the screen. And if someone wants to do your job, uh, of course not yours, because I hope you still will be there for the next 10 years, but something similar. So what advice would you give to him or to her? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. My career has been completely accidental. So, um, so but uh, you know, my training is in math and physics and, and biomedical science. And so that training really just represents a really broad technical and scientific training. And I, and I you know, of course, had to code along the way just because every, every discipline requires you to code. So, so I would just say, you know, good math, good science background, good, good uh, uh, fine arts background. I'm a musician, stuff like that. Just be a, and go where your, your passions lead and you'll end up in a job like this. So I've, I've always taken jobs that are entertaining and fun to do. And that's been the requirement is that they entertain me. And, uh, and if they do that, they'll end up being, you know, part of the, the leadership of, of XR at NVIDIA. Um, what are your, your next plans for the next, for the next year? What, uh, what do you want to obtain? Oh, it's so, so really to bring streaming XR to the world, right? To see, you know, how soon can we, what, what pieces of the ecosystem do we have to push on to get XR at the edge sooner, right? So everything, everything at NVIDIA is about, you know, we see the future, I say 10 years. So can, can we somehow help the ecosystem create platforms at NVIDIA that will reduce that 10 years to four years? So, so everything we think about is how do we get to that future that looks so interesting? How do we get there sooner? And how do we bring it to more people? And so for me, that's streaming XR. And my, my biggest goal is, is to democratize streaming XR for everybody and get it there faster than it should be. 
I, I really hope so. And the last question that is I always ask to everyone is if you have anything, something that you would have liked to say in this interview and I haven't asked you, so it's like you you have um, a free answer, say something to my to my viewers and to my readers, whatever you want. Yeah, I think I think we've covered it all. We're all excited about this idea of a wireless headset that you just slip on and you're automatically in whatever data environment you want to be in. And uh, Cloud XR is part of the, the path to getting there. And uh, and I just really appreciate chatting with you. It's been it's been fun. So so no hidden message or super message I have. Just uh, check out Cloud XR, and, and we look forward to working with everybody. Okay, thanks for your time, Greg. Um, thanks for everyone watching this interview. Um, we should, thanks a lot, and wish you a good day. Thanks, appreciate it.